All right. Well, hello everyone. Welcome to Microsoft Build Ask the Experts on Microsoft Teams. This is session code CATE40, just to make sure that you've joined the right session. My name is Paulette Lee and I'm with the Microsoft Teams team and uh, I'm going to go through a couple of housekeeping items before I introduce our moderator. So how to engage in this session? Be sure to use the chat box to ask any questions. Looks like we have some coming in already. You can post anom anonymously or use your name. And uh, if you see questions that you want answered, do use the like button so that we can indicate to our experts that that question is very important for us to answer verbally. And all of our experts will answer them verbally. And uh, if there's a lot of questions coming in, we'll do our best to answer them um, you know, in the order that they came in. We do have a lot of experts standing by, so keep those questions coming. Etiquette wise, this session is recorded by our events team, so you don't need to record on your own. It will be available to you for one year on the website. And please help our moderators and our speakers and not spam the chat. These are the set of topics that we'll be discussing today and with our Microsoft experts standing by to have a discussion on these. So take a look and um, start to formulate your questions. Um, again, we had a session on all of these topics, BRK40. I'll put that in the chat window so you can check it out after the event. And now I'd like to turn it over to Weston Lander, who is going to moderate our session today. Awesome. Thanks, Paulette. Um, really excited about uh, the group of folks we have on the call today to answer all of your questions. So make sure you fire those into the chat. Um, we have uh, some that we're already kind of talking about uh, that I'd like to maybe start off with. And uh, I'd say the first one actually would be for Hal and his team that worked on Live Share. So Hal, for the folks who uh, maybe watched the Jeff Teeper session, there was a lot about kind of sharing of that video scenario. Um, what are some of the other interesting scenarios that you can use live share for beyond just kind of sharing that interactive video that we saw? I'm kind of curious um, what those might look like. So you asked me what are other, what are other scenarios besides co-viewing that people yes. can use live share with? And so one of the interesting, one of the good things about live share is that it's it's designed for uh, making any kind of collaborative meeting experience happen. So in particular, what we what, what what you can build is anything that you could build with Fluid, right? In the Fluid, anything you can build with the Fluid framework, you could build as a live share experience. So you can build any kind of collaborative app, and then live share in particular adds a set of of uh, meeting specific ephemeral classes that enable you to do things that are. Uh, more interactive in a meeting so you can create things like annotations uh, notifications or events so you could have experiences similar you could build things like powerpoint live uh, where you have a presenter view and an attendee view or you could have an experience where you are uh, attempting to to ink across the screen to draw someone's attention uh, the good news so the, at a high level you can build anything you want to build and then you can build those for specific in meeting scenarios I know Sid or, or Ryan, would you like to add a little bit more to that question? Uh, yeah, I can. I can add a little bit of context. Um, so one thing that uh, uh, we're really excited about, um, even within video, uh, in cases where you can show, um, you know, go a little bit beyond what you normally might do with just, uh, you know, some type of co-watching or co-streaming. Um, experience is that you can layer on additional things like the annotations that Hal was talking about. You can also uh, define the roles of the, um, the the meeting attendees that you want to be able to control playback. So, for example, Teams has a lot of education users, and uh, teachers might not want students to be able to pause or play a video unannounced um, while watching it. But you can still, um, because we allow rule verification on a per object level, you can have the teacher be able to pause or play a video while allow allowing students or, um, you know, someone being uh, like somebody who's being tutored, um, still be able to give feedback on the video or, um, 
you know, things like that. So we're really excited about about that aspect as well. Awesome, awesome. Thanks so much. Um, there's a, a question I've seen about the Teams toolkit actually. And so I'm gonna actually kick it over to John, but let me read this off here real quick. So John, the question is, um, what does the Teams toolkit really do to actually make, hold on, what is, uh, what is the, I'll, I'll kind of rephrase this. What does the Teams toolkit do to make the uh, development experience a little bit easier? And how does that actually kind of close the loop on developing for Teams? Like, what does it actually accelerate? We talked about that in Jeff's session. So just kind of curious, what what's the difference between me just sideloading an app, uh, kind of how I would do it before, and what does the toolkit really do to change that value? Sure. So. How does the toolkit help you accelerate app development? Maybe yep. if I think about that question. Uh, so I think the main thing the toolkit allows you to do is quickly get started. So we have a couple app templates to try and focus on like what your business scenario is. So you can get started really quickly. You don't have to go searching for different tools. You can do everything in one place. And, and where it really shines is it helps you do a lot of the configuration that would otherwise be kind of tedious between different portals. So it helps you register your app. It helps you set up SSO if you want it. It helps you create the Azure AD applications. It helps you create the bot and the registrations and link all these things together in just a few clicks. And then you can also just press start debugging or F5 and get that nice loop, be able to edit your app, see it running inside of Teams, debug it, set breakpoints, and develop and not have to set up any other tooling. Um, so I think that's really a power of kind of accelerating. And then once you're ready to go to the next step, it closes the loop by giving you tooling to provision and deploy uh, all those resources that it created. So for things like bots, if you have a bot framework registration, the toolkit will also help you uh, set those things up to be able to provision. You can use our CLI tool if you want to kind of put that in a CI CD environment and you can kind of do everything in one set. Awesome. And, and kind of where are we at with the difference between Visual Studio and Visual Studio Code? Um, I know that we have both options. Just curious, uh, or we have toolkits for both. Um, where, what's the difference between the two, and where they're at? Sure. Right now, the the difference is that the VS Code extension focuses on JavaScript and TypeScript apps, so those web technologies, and kind of builds on the Node stack. And the Visual Studio uh, extension is available as a preview in. Visual Studio 2022 and really focuses on .NET technologies and building apps with Blazor right now. So that's the template that we've chosen to start with. And we're we're building out more to be able to focus on more .NET technologies as well. And the VS Code toolkit um, was just announced as GA. Um, so that also has uh, uh, some more features in it right now, which we are, we are bringing into VS, but we're also rethinking how do those things fit in with .NET? And, you know, we'll see some differences there and what the UX might be and um, the way we build out like things like provisioning and what does that mean in a .NET environment. Um, but we want to be able to provide like the same way to accelerate uh, your app development and be able to provide an end-to-end -end solution for both. Awesome, awesome, thanks so much. Um, one thing that uh, I have, uh, or I see in the question that's kind of a follow-up and I don't know if you're the right one for this, John. Um, the an anonymous individual said that uh, Teams takes a long time to uh, to Teams debug takes a long time to load uh, the Teams app. Is there a recommended way on minimizing kind of the startup time in dev mode? I don't know if that's for you or if you'd like to kick that over to someone else. Hmm. Not sure. It could be many things, but as far if I think about what is the recommended way to speed that up, um, if, if, I guess it depends if using the toolkit. That's really where my expertise are. Um, and right now, we with the toolkit, we know that the debug experience is a little bit slow, um, especially in VS Code with you know, things like npm install can take a long time. So we have some features in there that can do these things automatically for you, um, and we'll speed that up. But this is definitely an area that we're looking at making faster. Uh, so I think over the next few months, as we work on that, uh, you'll see improvements there. And if it's not with the toolkit, then you know, I would encourage you to try the toolkit and then you can submit feedback on our GitHub page and let us know what type of you know challenges you're seeing, what times you're seeing. Maybe your times are way more than I'm thinking. Um, and then we can definitely dive into that with you. 
Awesome. Um, let's see, I have another question here. Uh, it's about live share again, so I'm going to kick it over to Hal uh, after this, but could we talk, could you kind of share the differences between live share and like the interactive stage that we uh, released last year? I think there's some confusion there. Sure, I'd, I'd be happy to. So they're actually uh, closely related, right? So the interactive stage is what enables um, developers to, to uh, share their application into the teams, into the center of, of the team's calling window. Um, it enables you to, to, to sort of point to, to an endpoint and have that web page appear. What Live Share does is it makes it possible for you to build applications that you can then show on the interactive stage and then keep the all the participants in sync between those experiences. So it helps you build it. It helps you keep those experiences in sync. Um, it helps make it possible for you to for you to, to create new experiences on top of that. Uh, but I'll I'll throw up, I'll open as well to you know Ryan or Steve or Sid to add any additional commentary. It's it's a good question. Yeah. So this is Steve. Um, so I would just kind of add on to that and say that basically. Um, the share to stage functionality kind of got you started uh, with being able to create apps for uh, Teams meetings, but you pretty much it was left up to you to build your own kind of infrastructure for how you synchronize all the clients across a meeting and so forth. And really, what uh, Live Share SDK adds to the component adds to the the mix is a collection of pre-built components that just kind of take care of all of that for you. You don't need to worry about deploying you know, a complex uh, service uh, collaboration service. We take care of deploying a fluid service for you um, to manage all of the uh, synchronization of your components. Uh, and then we just provide you a lot of tools that make it super simple to for a given meeting, um, you know, create great collaborative experiences using just JavaScript. Um, I wanted to add on one comment to like how to debug. Um, like Teams meetings apps in particular, one tip that I would give is uh, don't forget about the Teams uh, web client. A lot of times it's, it's difficult to, to debug directly from within the Teams client, but the, uh, if you use the Teams web client to debug your meeting apps in particular, you have access to F12 developer tools and it's just a, a, going to be a much more familiar kind of browser experience from a debugging perspective. Awesome, awesome. Thanks for that overview. Um, there was an announcement um, that was kind of uh, quickly hit in a few of our sessions today, and it was on uh, link unfurling. So Soup Money uh, is our expert there, and I would love to kind of hear a little bit more about the process, like. What are the steps you actually need to take to make link unfurling happen? And um, what are some kind of recommended paths for uh, developers out there who'd want to bring that to life quickly? Um, yeah, for sure. Hi, this is. <laughs> Hi, this is the committee. Hello. OK. Sorry, there was a bit of an audio glitch here. Um, this is Sukmini Lamba. I'm happy to talk about um, kind of the different paths for link unfurling and also a couple um, new exciting features coming up in that space. Um, so link unfurling is an existing kind of capability that we've had in the product. It's very um, kind of in context. Um, uh, you know, for users, it kind of drives collaboration right in the flow of conversation. So as soon as a user pastes a link, if your app has, um, you know, set up itself for link unfurling capabilities, it'll unfurl into um, an adaptive card, a rich adaptive card experience with, um, you know, some rich actions that users can take on it. Now, um, the two particular areas that we've invested in for uh, link unfurling are the first one is zero install link unfurling. So, um, so far for a user to actually see an unfurled um, adaptive card when they share a link that's related to your app. For example, let's take um, GitHub. If someone pastes a GitHub issue link, um, as soon as the link is pasted, we would actually prompt the user to install the app 
um, and consent to it. And after that, it would unfurl into kind of a richer GitHub card with, um, you know, some information about the issue, who created it, um, when it's due, etc. Um, now with zero install link unfurling, if you do the work to kind of set your, your app up for this, and I'll talk about the exact steps that need to be taken, um, links will start to unfurl automatically without a user actually having to go through the steps to um, install the app and consent to it. So it's a lot more kind of real time, low friction. And the way um, you can kind of set your app up for zero install link unfurling is um, the first thing is you have to opt into this feature um, via a um, specific place in the manifest. And then there is a new type of um, payload request that we'll be sending to all apps that opt in for the zero install feature for their link unfurling. Um, it's called the compose extension um, slash anonymous query link payload. Um, after these two steps are um, taken by your app, um, if the app doesn't require auth, cards are just going to automatically unfurl without any further um, kind of action from the user or the developer. Um, and if the app does require auth, um, we'll unfurl a basic kind of preview for the app, which you can again set up. So while a lot of the information behind what the exact GitHub issue is, for example, is hidden behind the user authorizing in, um, even if the user has an auth in, you can share some information like a skeleton of what would unfurl on the preview. So it's a lot more um, kind of informative of what um, will show up on the um, card once the user signs in. So we're basically you know, improving that kind of top of funnel experience. Um, the other um, investment that we've made in link unfurling, which is also going to be um, coming up pretty soon, is uh, something we're calling um, template based adaptive cards. Um, and it's basically powering rich actionable previews in the scenario that you don't actually have an app built for teams, but you'd like to take advantage of, um, you know, kind of some of the in context um, in the uh, flow of conversation experiences. Now, the way that, you know, rich actionable previews or appless link unfurling works is um, there is meta tags out there that Microsoft um, and you know some other leading tech companies have invested in um, called based on the schema.org standard. Um, schema.org basically is what powers um, a lot of the uh, search engine um, response pages today and other structured kind of web content emails and is generally used extensively for search engine optimization. It's pretty robust. It's used by about 10 million plus um, websites out there. So if you know you want to take advantage of rich actionable previews, which is it's like link unfurling, but if you don't have an app set up, you can kind of take advantage of this is um, provide the um, uh, schema.org meta tags onto your app, onto your website uh, metadata. And um, in specific, there's a number of types of schema.org tags that we're supporting. So if you um, kind of tag on to one of those types that we support. And I talk about this a little bit more in my um, uh, kind of build uh, on-demand session as well. It's called building rich micro capabilities using link unfurling. So if you tag on to one of these like, you know, top types, um, you'll be able to take advantage of the template based previews that we're creating and users will be able to interact with your um, URLs um, unfurling into kind of a richer card from where they can take actions and navigate to the right content on your website and also related content. And the way to take advantage of that, like I said, is um, to tag your website with um, the schema.org meta tags and in specific with potential actions so that we can add the relevant actionable buttons to your link previews. Um, yeah, that's those are the two features. Uh, pretty exciting. Definitely take a look at the um, on demand session for more details. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, let's see what else do we have going on? Um, Steve and Skyler, uh, there's a question about um, the ability to like bring your own uh, Azure Fluid Relay service. I'm wondering if you could go into a bit of detail on those that might already have something set up versus uh, folks utilizing the services that we talked about providing today. So sure, either I Steve can, or Skyler, feel free to yeah, jump I'll, in. I can start and then I'll hand over to uh, Skyler. Um, so the uh, LiveShare SDK includes a special um, uh, Fluid client called the Teams Fluid client. If you're familiar with Fluid at all, you'll be aware that there are a couple of different clients. There's a tiny delicious client for local development and Azure Fluid uh, client, which is used to talk to the Azure Fluid relay service now. Um, and then uh, for the live share SDK, we created a special 
a client that knows how to talk to our fluid instance called the team uh, teams fluid client. That client, you can actually configure it with the same parameters that you would pass to an Azure fluid client. So um, if you're using our, our Teams fluid client, it works like normal fluid client. Um, the difference is that any data that's shared in that container is only going to live for 24 hours, and actually you should consider it kind of gone after the, after the end of the meeting. We don't give any guarantees past that. That's hence the name ephemeral and all of our components. Um, but there are definitely scenarios where you may want to build a Teams meeting app that has longer lifetimes uh, for Fluid stuff. So we do enable you the ability to uh, go and provision your own Fluid Relay service, and then you can just provide us whenever you call the Teams Fluid client. You can pass in your uh, fluid container information or your fluid tenant info, and then we will go ahead and use that instead of our fluid container. Uh, but everything else kind of works the same. We take care of getting you into the meeting and getting everyone into, the, into your container essentially. So uh, I don't know, Skylar, is there anything you want to build on top of that with? Uh, yeah, I, I don't have too much to add to that. I think it was a pretty good representation of uh, what we're trying to do here. Um, we definitely recognize there's a collection of scenarios uh, that, that you want to build when we're talking about collaboration um, from, you know, like you have an application, a web application that you're interested in making collaborative um, and uh, Fluid in particular, Azure Fluid Relay. Uh, we're, we're trying to kind of provide this ability for any application to build collaboration. Uh, the stuff Steve and team is doing, which means like, you know, bringing your Azure Fluid Relay or leveraging the one they're, they're providing you um, provides like augmentation or ephemeral kind of like uh, data structures that enable you to kind of build collaboration into teams. So slightly targeting two different uh, scenarios here, but we do think they can work together. So um, yeah, so providing you a variety of kind of options here. Awesome. Thanks for the great overview, gents. Um, there's been a lot of talk about Fluid and the many ways that it's getting used across Teams and the Microsoft stack today. Nick, I think you had a pretty cool session. Uh, do you maybe want to give folks a rundown on, on what they can expect if they uh, join your on demand? Sure, absolutely. Um, so there's an on demand session. I think it's on demand session 12, um, OD 12. And that session goes into a lot more detail on one of the code demos that Hal walked through um, during during this session, the session this is about. And so we go into quite a lot of depth on the code and there are links to the actual code, the repo, which is now open source. So you can go and play with the code to your heart's content. And we have partners from Autodesk and from Hexagon who um, are talking about their um, investments in Fluid and how they're using it, as well as um, internal application partners, um, Whiteboard, who also talk about how they're using Fluid. So it's um, it's about 15 minutes. And if you want to get a little bit more detail on how to actually build an app using Fluid and the Azure Fluid Relay, um, that would be a good bet. Awesome. Definitely one to check out. Um, one team we haven't, we've talked a lot about Fluid today and all of the exciting uh, stuff coming uh, from that team. But one area we haven't touched on as much um, was the uh, the JS SDK, the new JS SDK. And so, uh, Divyanka, I was wondering if you could maybe uh, hop on and just give folks Maybe if they missed it, or maybe we could go into a bit more detail on on what the opportunity is there and any sessions that uh, folks should check out in order to learn more about the JS SDK 2.0. Uh, definitely, Weston, and uh, thank you. And I'm going to frame my answer in context of a question that was asked as well. So the okay. question that was asked was, uh, do we have any news on when Teams 2.0 is going to be available? So I did want to point out that the Teams JS SDK version 2.0 is in general availability starting today. And you can upgrade. It's a frictionless update from SDK version 1 to version 2. Uh, it's a developer-facing milestone. So as you adopt this SDK as well as the manifest, 
test, you will be able to take the launch pages, uh, the, the personal tabs of your team's applications and the search based message extensions of your apps, and you'll be able to extend them to new Microsoft host apps. So the apps that you're looking at is Outlook on web and Windows, as well as office.com. Um, I did want to uh, also add to that, that uh, when you say whether Teams 2.0 is available or not, then absolutely Teams today is Teams 2.0. We are promising frictionless update, backwards compatibility. There is full production level support for all existing Teams applications. And I know as developers, you must be really curious about how is it that we have evolved our SDK. And we have a great session. It's an on-demand session which does a deep dive into the evolution of the SDK. And we touch upon topics such as how have we reorganized the APIs into uh, logical groupings called capabilities and what does the capability model mean for developers and how can they leverage it to really enable contextually relevant uh, scenarios because it's not just about taking your existing application and it's sticking it in new Microsoft 365 surfaces, but making it really meaningful for end users and lighting up connect connected experiences across M365. So I really uh, recommend everyone who's interested in this topic join that session. Uh, engineers from our team are talking about it in deep detail and it's an exciting one. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing all that. Um, I'm not seeing any new questions, so kind of last call on questions. If someone wants to fire it into the Q&A window, um, we're about up on time. And all right. I think with that, Paulette, I might kick it back over to you to close things out. Great. Thank you, Wes, and thank you all of our presenters and speakers and our team's experts for that insight. Um, and thank you everyone for attending. Be sure to check out all of our sessions at Microsoft Build. We have a lot of on-demands. We have about 18, <clears throat> 18 on-demand sessions. Um, we have an into focus coming up tomorrow. So all the direct links are in the uh, digital brochure there that you see on the screen, aka.ms WAC team sessions. So thank you everyone for joining and have a great rest of the build and uh, we'll see you tomorrow in our sessions uh, breakout and into focus. Thank you. Bye bye.